aligns with your faith. People actually pray for you, they encourage you, and it's proven too. It's been going strong for over 30 years now. So call now. You can get one low monthly price for up to 10 years. You're not stuck with increasing costs. You can do something about this today. Call MetaShare 65 Plus. Find out how much you can save. Call 833-45-BIBLE. That's 833-45-BIBLE. 833-45-BIBLE. You know, there are many ways we can impact the world around us. Some are more direct, like helping our neighbors and serving in our churches. Other ways are broad, like becoming community leaders or supporting missions. Of course, taking care of our families is a given. If there was a way to impact all of those at once, would you be interested? The AFA Foundation is a great way to touch your family, your neighbors, and even complete strangers all over the country. You may not realize it, but you can support AFA with a charitable gift annuity, a trust, your will, or a charitable rollover. We realize not everyone knows what those are or how to set them up, but that's okay. Many of your questions can be answered on our website, afafoundation.net. Find answers and resources to help you make an informed decision. And if your decision is to move forward, you can get in touch with Riley, Chelsea, or Jessica to start setting up your legacy. Touch more lives than you imagine possible when you visit afafoundation.net today. At the Core Podcast are available at afr.net. Now, back to At the Core on American Family Radio. Welcome back to the second segment of today's show. Walker Wildman here with you. Glad to be with you on the program. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We also live stream this show online at AFR.net and on the American Family Radio app. So if you want to listen to the show live or any of our programming live, it's streaming all the time, 24-7 at um, AFR.net and the American Family Radio app. We do have a guest that I want to introduce for this segment, Marcia Metzger. She's executive director of Parents on the Level. ParentsOnTheLevel.com is their website. She's also author of the Parent Navigator, and uh, she's with us now. Marcia, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me today, Walker. Well, Marcia, uh, you've been on the program before. I was out that week. Uh, Fred Jackson interviewed you on this uh, similar uh, subject matter, but. Uh, your organization, organization, Parents on the Level, uh, give us some background to the organization, uh, why it began, and then we'll jump into some of these public education issues. Great. Um, well, generally what had happened in my case was I was a person that was on the inside of the schools for a little while in Pennsylvania when we lived there. My husband's a pastor, and so I worked in the crisis pregnancy centers there, and I went out into the public schools, something that the average person probably wouldn't do to teach about abstinence education. So that's where I got my start. From there, we moved to South Georgia, and you would think in South Georgia that they would be open to the message of abstinence in the schools. It aligns with the state laws and everything for sex education in Georgia to teach abstinence and to teach um, about family and and marriage and that this is something we would want for our society in general even you know just teaching it in that aspect what surprised me is I could not get into the first school with our message and that was really just surprising because I was looking at 12 different school districts so I started digging and when I started digging that's when I found out about social and emotional learning and all of this digital curriculum that has all kind of Marxist elements in it so that is a nutshell of how I got started because I had to pretty much start my own organization. I was learning so much and just couldn't let it go because it really, I felt like the Lord was having me just dig into it so I could expose what's taking place. Mm. Take us through, not just some of the things you uncovered, but but how we got here, because it's, it's quite interesting to see how quickly our uh, public education system and even some of the private education has deteriorated and has become really counter-American or anti-American uh, and anti-Christian at that. Um, how did we get here? I mean, this is a, a lot of people we know, even today, that work as teachers and administrators are good people. Many of them are Christians, but the system itself has been completely hijacked. How on earth did we get here? Well, there's a lot of different theories on how we got here. Maybe not a lot, but several. 
And some people actually think that, and, and I, I tend to follow this, uh, people like Alex Newman, pretty much, he, he's done a lot of writing about how pretty much our schools were designed to do this with people like um, Mr. Dewey and um, Ed, you know, um, Edward Mann, a lot of these people that originated with this information in the schools designed it to do like this. Um, the, the communist aspects of what was uh, taking root in America back in, in the 60s and the, the sexual revolution, uh, all of these things came to roost during the 60s, which, you know, I was born in 64 myself. So when I look at that and I think of what was going on my entire career during the schools, uh, my, my schooling and everything from the 60s, the sexual revolution, I think, is where the toehold was because what they got um, Congress to do and a lot of states to do was to actually codify bringing sex education into the schools. From there, a lot of this other stuff has just blossomed. Um, we've gone into bullying education. We've gone into Aaron's Law, which is about not being sexually abused. And then we've gone into now a social and emotional learning aspect that is a mental health program in the schools. And they're using all of this to be able to bring in subjects. They can, they can trigger conversations with students known as culturally relevant teaching. And that's, they'll take a lesson and they will manipulate it in order to introduce the d diversity, equity, and inclusion and all of those buzzwords you're hearing about today. So it has been well planned and thought out. And um, you know, if you read actually the 1963 communist goal sheet, I don't know if you've looked at that lately, but you can look it up. And pretty much a lot of these different elements are spelled out in that. And that is what we're seeing take place in our schools today. Mm. Yeah, it, it, when I went through, and of course it wasn't that long ago, I'm not gonna try to act like I'm an old book, but when I went through <laughs> um, um, high school and um, I got a four year degree at a, at a state university here in Mississippi, Mississippi State, um, I was, especially in college, I was aware of the liberal leanings, the heavy liberal leanings, even in a conservative state like Mississippi. I mean, I, uh, one of my professors was uh, out, proud, homosexual, um, and, and, and one of the political science departments was, um, a few of the classes had uber-liberal professors, so I was aware um, it wasn't suffocating, but it was definitely there. It was it was in your face, um, and they weren't all that way. But as we move on, uh, Marcia, it, it's becoming more and more common, more and more common. So so what what's the what's the scale of this? Are we talking uh, pockets of the U.S. or are we talking pretty broadly here as far as the Marxist leanings and the Mar Marxist effects on America's education system? It is everywhere. It's in all American school system schools, government run schools, and it's pretty much, you know, all of these different digital systems. I don't know if you looked at my um, webinar page on my um, parentsonthelevel.com. Uh, when you see all of these different schools or, or, or all of these different companies that are in the schools, the digital programming, every single one of them they you can find these common threads throughout and the thing is they all just converged at the pandemic i mean i have one one company that we exposed called edgenuity in 2013 they changed their name from e2020 to edgenuity why would they be called e2020 they knew this was coming that this that they were planning for this so, you know, there's so many different things, even the way they're named, the way they design themselves. And also, you know, when you think about social and emotional learning, how that was designed, I have a three-part series where that came from. All of these different systems, uh, <laughs> it's just so overwhelming. And, and, and then also think about it this way, as they come here, as, as they've begun to do the work that they've, they've planned to do, as they have come here, they have designed themselves in a way where they can update and change in, in, at any time with their fluid and dynamic digital programming. So here's another part. A teacher can make an assignment to a student. They won't even know for sure it's the same assignment that they review that they think is there. It could have some little nuances to it. So there's a lot of different things going on and it's such a, a 
huge subject, it's even hard to narrow down and talk about one part of it. Um, it's it's everywhere though. So so you're saying that teachers might give out what they think is a fine curriculum, a fine assignment, um, but then on the website or whatever kind of software is being used to by the students, they get on there and little little.